Welcome to the Five Senses podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Robert Zinni, and this is our first episode, and I'm so gracious to have uh, our guest, Alan Dean Foster, who's been in Prescott for, how many years have been in Prescott? 40 years. 40 years. Uh, he'll be here talking about his career on science fiction writing, novelization, and uh, just before we sat down, we got to know each other a little bit more, and so I, I think I have some like on-the-cuff um, questions for you, Alan, if that's cool. Anything you got. All right, so um, first, uh, I want to ask, how did you find Prescott, Arizona? We were living in Big Bear Lake, California, which is a lot like Flagstaff, okay. which means it's really cold, and my wife wanted a Victorian house originally. And I wasn't particular about the house, but I was particular about the climate. Right. And I'd pretty much had it with shoveling out the house every winter. We happened to run across an issue of Arizona Highways, and the cover article was on Prescott. Hmm. And featured on the cover was one of the Victorian houses downtown on Mount Vernon Street. So we thought, let's go take a look in Prescott, see if we can find anything. The first thing we discovered was that all the really nice Victorian houses in Prescott are downtown, not too far from the chicken fried you know, Kentucky Fried franchise. We didn't want that. And our realtor was very enterprising and looked at a lot of different houses and eventually called us up in Flagstaff and said, I'm just trying to get an idea of what you might be interested in. And he brought us down to look at this house that was not for sale. And we looked at it and it was everything we both wanted. And we said, uh, ask them how much they'll take for it if uh, it was for sale. Okay. which is not a really good opening ploy in real estate. And we ended up buying it, couldn't afford it, okay. and we've been in it for 40 years. You've been here in Prescott for majority of your life. Yeah. So what are some of the things that you love about our community in Prescott? They call it everybody's hometown. Right. It really is. When we came in originally, we came in the back way down White Spar. Okay. And so just about the first thing you see after a few minutes is the courthouse square. And we were immediately struck by how clean everything was. Remember, we were coming from Los Angeles, but still, everything was clean. There wasn't a lot of debris in the streets. There wasn't debris on the lawn around the courthouse. And it struck us that this is a place that the people who live here really love yeah. because they take care of it. And we were sold from that point on, really. Mm -hmm. Nice. So... Um I've also read in your biography that you're a power lifter. So do you do power lifting here in Prescott or like, because you're a world uh, world record holder for Just one. Lifting. Just one? Just okay. one. As far as I know, it's still there. Okay. And a bunch of state records. But I used to play a lot of basketball and I wasn't very good, but it was good exercise. And when I got to where it wasn't advisable for me to play basketball anymore, I had lifted weights in college a little bit and I thought, well, I can do that. And a local coach and world record holder himself, a wonderful guy named Paul Gillot, saw me lifting in the YMCA one day and said, have you ever thought of competing? And I was like, well, all these guys are built like trolls. <laughs> but he said, no, you don't understand. You compete against guys in your own age group as well as weight group. And I thought, well, I'll try one meet. And I was absolutely terrified. But I was the only one in my age and weight group. Okay. So I won. Even better. I thought, well, this is cool. <laughs> So I kept at it, and I got a lot better at it, and I, I still do it for exercise. I rarely compete anymore for various okay. physical reasons. Right. But it's one, it is really wonderful exercise, and it keeps everything functional. Okay. Uh, kind of like owning a, a nice race car, I guess, and taking it out on the track once in a while just to make sure it still works. Right. So, yes, I still lift here. Okay. So, like, how, how much have you lifted before? What's your average that you get to, like, bench or... Uh, well, I'm not young anymore, right? <laughs> but I can still bench 235 cleanly mm -hmm. and probably deadlift around, I don't know, three and a quarter. But uh, when I was setting records in, say, the 65 to 69 age group, I could bench close to 300 clean and wow, okay. deadlift about 335. And, you know, it, this is nothing compared to what really impressive lifters even older lifters, especially older lifters, can lift. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a guy back east named Bugs Bear, and his bench is okay, but Bugs is the same age and weight class as I am, and, and Bugs has records of like, in the 65 to 69 group, this squat 435 pounds, wow. deadlift 502 pounds. And mm -hmm. He's a funny guy, Bugs, but he's very generous. Most 
Most lifters you'll find are really, really nice people. And they're always rooting for each other. And it's, it's funny because the people who know that I power lift don't know that I'm a writer. Right. Unless we've discussed it. And the people that know me as a writer have no idea that I'm a competitive power lifter. Right. It's like you can't be one or the other or like, um, you know, it's it, like because I'm an outdoor athlete as well. So like people are like, oh, you, you run, but then you also do film and other things like that. I'm like, yeah, I'm a well-rounded person, right? Because you have to balance it out. So is there a stigma of like being a writer and a power lifter? Uh, I don't know many other people who do that. Okay. So there probably aren't, probably aren't enough people for there to be a stigma attached to it yet. Right. Uh, but I only know one other writer in my immediate circle who does the same thing, and he's 30 years younger than I okay. am. Okay. So is it, is it like a shock when you're like, hey, I'm a writer to these like buff guys? No, that's not a shock. Okay. But if people who know me as a writer find out that I power lift, that's a shock. That's a shock, okay. Because it's the, the idea is you're supposed to sit in a chair hunched over your computer or whatever, mm -hmm. and just write and not do anything else. I mean, maybe you jog a little bit or you swim a little bit, but the idea that you do something that's considered, you know, a real physical sport is just kind of alien to a lot of people who you know, follow literature or follow, you know, classical music or something. Right. It's more sedentary than anything. Yeah, with it's, those. it's like my musical tastes. I love classical music and metal. Right. Yeah. Because you wrote an, uh, it was like last month, your article about... Um, On metal. Symphonic yeah, symphonic metal. symphonic metal, yeah. but it was symphony plus metal uh, equals that. Yeah, and it's hard to find somebody to talk about both both kinds of music with because mm -hmm. classical music people generally don't listen to metal. No, they don't. Uh, but you, in fact, you'll find more people who listen to metal and classical than the other way around, okay. although that's still probably a pretty small percentage. Right, well, I think classical music is kind of dying in the realm because you have... Uh, only a certain uh, number of stations, but then what gets the airtime as well as metal or rock or indie rock or rap, right? I think the problem with classical music in this country is that the orchestras are required to get a certain number of donations in order to stay functional. Hmm. Okay. And as a result, they play the same stuff over and over again because that's what a lot of the people who donate want to hear. Hmm. And there are dozens and dozens of wonderful composers who never get played in this country. Right. Never get played. But they have a huge life on CDs and on downloads. And I think that's what keeps classical music alive. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm not a fan of sitting in the audience in a suit and a tie with your wife all... Yes, exactly. With your wife all dressed up. In the early days of classical music... A lot of people sometimes at certain concerts would jump around and they'd shout at the orchestra and it would be more like a rock concert. Mm -hmm. And women, when Franz Liszt used to play the piano... Oh, Liszt, yeah. Yeah, they used to throw their underwear at the, at the stage. And oh, really? I wouldn't expect to see that with the L.A. Philharmonic necessarily. Uh -uh. But this idea that you sit rock still and don't say anything and don't move and don't do anything when you're listening to music that is supposed to elicit an emotional response seems to me kind of contradictory. Mm -hmm. That's why I loved watching uh, Leonard Bernstein's concerts okay. uh, for young people when I was growing up on TV because you would see some interact the audience. At one point, if the orchestra was playing something that was humorous, mm -hmm. kids would laugh. Right. It's almost like, like you have to get this bread out of them as they get older. And I think that's wrong. No, I agree with you because music is that form of art where the musicians are communicating with each other. Like, I love jazz music. I have a lot of friends who are jazz mu musicians, and a lot of those jazz musicians uh, started off with playing classical uh, music. So, like, my one friend, Michael, he loves Rachmaninoff, so I can tell you um, a lot about Rachmaninoff for our friends' list. Um, but it's that communication amongst the uh, musicians, and then when you're at a concert, they're communicating to you, and like you said, it evokes that emotional response to you. So I totally agree with you that um, sitting in an audience and just clapping a little like this isn't so thrilling for the audience member. Yeah, and the composers that they don't play. Right. I'm talking about really wonderful, listenable, exciting music from the mid-20th century to mid-19th mid century, let's say. Mm -hmm. And none of these people get played. Mm -mm. Uh, and, you know, people like Havergal Ryan and Charles Turnemeyer um, and Jockey Bear, they play. It's often like uh, popular music today on the radio. Somebody has a hit. And they play the same hit over and over and over again. And you might be 
15 other songs on the album. You never hear any of the other songs. You never do. Ibert, the French composer, wrote a piece called The Scal Ports of Call. He wrote a lot of other really good music, but orchestras don't play it. Mm-hmm. And you, is it is it because when it goes on radio or like you said the donations they only want to play those hits? Yeah, and that's what people who donate seem to like. But I love Tchaikovsky. Okay. I love Tchaikovsky's music, uh, but they play the same stuff over and over again. Nobody plays. He wrote a wrote an opera and derived a suite from it. It's called Vakula the Smith. Mm-hmm. Even people who know Tchaikovsky don't seem to know that piece. It's a lovely piece. Never seen it advertised to be played loud, uh, played live. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rachmaninoff, even. Yeah. Uh, there's wonderful stuff that he wrote that they just don't play. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I don't know. That's my take on classical okay. music. So, um, so we're here with Alan Dean Foster, uh, science fiction writer. Um, we're going to get into that later, but since we're talking about classical music, I, I want to know what your take is um, from the controversy of John Williams and Gustav uh, Holtz. Um, I don't know if you know, but sure. there's always those comparisons of... Um, John Williams ripping off uh, Holtz with Mars the, from the Planets. Mars from the, the Planets, yeah, that's a great Imperial album. March, mm-hmm. absolutely. All artists are inspired by artists who come before them. It's it's inevitable, right? And the Imperial March does sound like Mars from Holtz's Suite, The Planets, right? But it's not the same thing. Uh-uh, it, right. it sounds like it. Mm-hmm. It's very close to it, but it's different. And the whole history of art has been like this. Everybody takes from everybody who's gone before them. Mm-hmm. Uh, Barack Mononoff wrote a piece, a lovely piece, called Rhapsody on a Theme of Paganini. So he didn't come up with the original theme. Paganini did. But nobody seems to call Rachmaninoff a plagiarist. No. And you do the variations on it. You do the changes on it. Mm-hmm. John Williams is entitled to do that as Rachmaninoff is. Right. Yeah, because when you listen to it side to side, I mean... I think they have the same progression, but it's totally different instruments and the way that they've um, crescendoed it, if you will. Um, but and it's and you, it's funny because it's like rap music, and I want to go back to like Queen and David Bowie's "Under Pressure" to like Vanilla, Vanilla Ice, um, definitely ripping it off. But he only says no, but it's a dunna instead of dunna na 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 na, right? So I guess you're right. Like from I'm I'm sure back in the day when it's just musical composers. They all ripped each other off. They all got inspired by yeah. it. And it's the way that you phrase it, too. Is this somebody ripped me off or are they inspired? Right. Hollywood is always dealing with this in film. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been ripped off. Yeah? How so? It's a major motion picture made out of one of my books. Okay. Which was a mashup with another writer's short story. Mm-hmm. And we've heard the term mashup used mostly in relation to music. Mm-hmm. But it happens in film, too. And it was very, very upset. And I've, I have emails and letters from people saying, I went to see this film and I thought it was this book of yours. But to prove that is difficult. It's particularly difficult in motion pictures. Even with copyright? It doesn't matter. Okay. It doesn't matter. It's you versus whatever giant studio is doing it. And the film comes out. The company makes its money. Everybody gets paid. And then they go on and do something else while their army of lawyers fights whatever guy you can get mm. to fight back. And I got a settlement out of this project. And my lawyer, who was with a firm in West Los Angeles, very good entertainment lawyers, they knew what they were doing, said they actually took it on a contingency basis. Okay. So I didn't even have to put any money up up front. And they said, we think you can win this. Or my lawyer said, we think you can win this. But it might take 10 years, and you might lose. And you're still responsible for ancillary costs for things like bringing in expert witnesses and all that. And my mother was aged in bad shape, and my wife was not doing well. And the settlement, while it didn't make me independently wealthy, was not five ninety five dollars either. And you have to make these choices in life, these realistic choices. And emotionally and professionally, I wanted to keep, I wanted to sue. Right but had to look down the line and see where I would be in however long it took for the case to come to fruition. And then you win, and they appeal. So it's, The idea is to wait until you die, and then the case goes away. And even and then you win, and you, and you have to collect. Mm-hmm. So it goes on and on and on. This is not just true of the motion picture business. This is true of many businesses where copyrights are at stake and uh, contracts are at stake. Mm-hmm. So you have to be prepared for it to dominate a large portion of the rest of your life. 
Right, no, I, I can see it's kind of like a divorce, right? You can be in court your yeah. whole life. Yeah. So when it came to the book that turned into the film, was it like the plot that they stole? Was it the characters that they... I can't tell you. You can't tell me? Okay. I, I signed a really non -disclosure, giant... Non-disclosure, right? Yes, yeah. non NDA non-disclosure agreement, and they'll come and take all of my blood and leave just this flaccid sack of a writer behind. <laughs> so, right. That's I can't tell you. That, that sucks, but... But the fans know. Okay. The fans who read the book know. And I have hundreds of emails that I say from people say, isn't this your book? And so I have that satisfaction of knowing right. that at least within the community of science fiction readers, mm -hmm. uh, people know. Back in the day, and you, please tell me if I'm wrong, but with your experience in film, it seems like it's, it was more like a rock star kind of a party. Is that correct for my assumption? Or is it just like people can do whatever they want in Hollywood? Or is people in... I wasn't that deep into okay. it. Okay. I really wasn't. I was really floating around on the outside. I was studying motion picture writing at UCLA. So I saw a few things there. And then I lived with my uncle for one year. Okay. Uh, it, it, fun things would happen. Nice things would happen. The routine in that house. My father got involved in a, a failed business venture in San Clemente. And for those who know Southern California geography, it's too far to commute from San Clemente to Los Angeles. But my uncle was living in Bel Air, and they had a nice house. They had a maid's room. They had no maid. And my uncle said, uh, uh, Alan, you know, why should he come try to commute? We have a maid's room. Why doesn't he stay in the maid's room for the school year? This was my junior year at UCLA, which would have been 1967. So it was great. I had a five-minute non-traffic commute to UCLA. I was, I was in heaven. And the routine in that household was on Sundays, everybody would sleep late. And then they would order deli in, and everybody would watch football in the afternoon. Why not? I always got up before everybody out else, and the house is nice and quiet. And I walk into the den, and I see there's somebody sleeping on the couch. So I walk over, and I look, and the person on the couch goes, Good morning. It's Julie Newmar, the original Catwoman. Okay. And I literally ran back to my rooms so like an outtake from American Pie 26. <laughs> and... Later, I asked my Aunt Harriet, which for those who don't know is an inside joke in the TV Batman series where Bruce Wayne's always talking about his Aunt Harriet. Oh, really? Okay. Well, that was my Aunt Harriet. I asked my Aunt Harriet, I said, why is Julie Newmar sleeping on the couch in your den? And my aunt told me, she said, ever since the show and the character have become such a huge hit, everybody in town is after her. Mm. She was single. And she doesn't trust anybody. Sometimes she gets lonely and she just wants to be around people. My uncle was a straight-up guy. He had three daughters. So Numar would come over and sleep on the couch just to be around people. And that made a real impression on me at the time. I thought, this is one of the most beautiful women in the, in the business. And she's so lonely, she's got to sleep on my uncle's couch because she doesn't trust anybody else. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, yeah, that's Hollywood for you. Well, that and it seems like your uncle provided that safe space, you know, because yes. you, when you're in a career like that, I, I can only imagine people want to take advantage of you, like financially, physically as well. Um, people could be um, manipulative. Um, and it's always nice to come back to a house where um, you just feel safe. You can be yourself around people. Nobody's going to try to yeah. hit on you, like if you're a exactly, woman, right? Exactly. Well, Numar is a shade under six feet. Okay. And I don't think anybody would try to take, and a dancer, and I don't think anybody would have tried to take advantage yeah. of her because mm -hmm. she would have kicked the crap out of anybody. Exactly. Who One tried. swing. Right Boink, there, yes. Right? Uh, before we get into writing, like, so you, you went to college for film studies and writing. Is that correct? Um, not originally. Okay. I went to college. You know those aptitude tests you take when you're in junior high and high school? Mm -hmm. And they all kept saying about me, I, well, you should be a lawyer. You should be a lawyer. We had some lawyers in the family. So I prepared to go to law school. So I, I majored in political science as an undergraduate at UCLA. And I got all of my necessary graduation credits together and I had some free classes I just had to take to fill out those credits and I discovered the film department at UCLA and I found out that you could get credit for watching movies oh, basically easy. take the history of American film 1920 1930 you go into UCLA's wonderful theater and the professor talks for 15 minutes and then you watch Buster Keaton for three and a half hours Not bad. four units same as four units of physics. Mm -hmm. So I took a bunch of film history courses, and I also took some writing courses because I had always been a facile writer. 
was probably the only kid in my high school who looked forward to essay tests. Hmm. While I was there, in addition to having some wonderful experiences and meeting some people in the film business, I sold a couple of short stories. I decided to try my hand at, at writing prose as, as well as screenplays. And I thought, well, this is fun. I'm watching movies, I'm getting easy grades in writing. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can get into the graduate film school. Never thinking that I ever would, because okay. I had no background in film. I was up against kids who had been making movies with with uh, eight millimeter cameras since they were five years old, like Spielberg. Right. right. And I got in. And my parents were not real happy because I'd also gotten into a couple of law schools. But I said, look, if I get a master's in fine arts, if I get an MFA from UCLA, I can get into any law school in the country because they know you can do graduate work. Mm -hmm. And I did get that degree. And while I was there, I thought, well, let's try a novel just to see what would happen. I thought, in 20 years when I'm a lawyer, if I'm a party, and people say, what are you doing? I can say, well, I'm working on a novel. And it sold on the third submission. Really? Okay. At that point, I thought, this is a lot more fun than getting up early in the morning and looking up precedents for the rest of my life. Oh, yeah. And putting on a suit and a tie. Let's try it for a year and see what happens. So I had saved some money. I got a part-time job and moved to Santa Monica at the beach and had a really good time and sold a second novel and everything just kind of went on from Snowballed there. from there? Yes. That seems like it was a pretty straight, uh, streamlined uh, process. Have you seen that business of um, writing and selling books change in the 40 years since, 50 years since you've started No, it's writing? changed. it's changed tremendously. Okay. The book business is now dominated by an online seller, right. Amazon, constantly warring with publishers uh, over matters of what books should cost and who gets what percentage. That's just business. Right. But the interesting thing is we went from having a lot of small bookstores, neighborhood bookstores, to giant bookstore chains like Books A Million and Barnes and & Noble. Mm -hmm. And what happened was then Amazon came along. And Amazon put them out of business, but the small specialty stores who emphasize service and stocking back titles that are otherwise not available have done really well. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can find, like here in Prescott, Peregrine. Peregrine, yeah, I'm surprised. Excellent bookstore. Yeah. Not a specialty bookstore, but really tops on service and recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's nice, you can go to Amazon and, and read reviews, read a reviews of a book, and they're useful when you trust them. Or you can go to some place like Peregrine, and somebody in there will actually talk to you about the book. So the bookstore is not disappearing. When uh, e-books first came out, everybody was, oh, it's going to kill the print business. And a funny thing happened. Uh, yes, a lot of people will buy just an e-book. But there are a fair number of people out there, apparently, who will buy the ebook for the convenience of reading it, and they'll like it so much that they'll then buy the hardcover or the paperback yeah. for a permanent library. Mm -hmm. Also, it's really hard to get a personalized signature on an ebook. Exactly. So, if you want to meet an author who's written something you love, you have to go and you know bring a real book. Mm -hmm. To comment on uh, the ebooks, I've never been a fan of ebooks because a uh, my eyes don't really um read on the screen i feel like i'm getting like fried in my mind but also there's that uh smell of books that you just can't replicate with anything else do you agree with that oh i agree completely mm -hmm. and i'm the same way also partly because of an eye situation yeah but there's just something about picking up a book as opposed to an, an ebook reader mm -hmm. and there's paper there and there's print there and you turn pages, it's a tactile experience. It is. Uh, I love seeing the, the books that I have on my bookshelf and I just love seeing it deteriorate over time because that means I spent a lot of time with this book. And then there are used bookstores. Right. And for somebody who loves to read, who loves the written word, there's nothing like a good used bookstore. Mm -hmm. uh, even going into a bookstore in some place like Heidelberg, Germany, which has a famous, has a number of used bookstores, but a particularly famous one that Sam Clemens, Mark Twain used to go into. It's still there. All right, what's it called? Because I'll be in Germany in May. So Okay, and you smell the old books, the really old books, and the aisles are deliberately narrow, I think, 
and you walk around and you, you're window shopping. It's like in a supermarket you've never been in before. You may not be looking for artichokes, but you pass the artichokes so you stop and look. Right. So you may be looking for European imperial history, and you'll pass a shelf on horsemanship. And there'll be something interesting in there, and you'll pick it up and look at it. Can't really do that with online books. Mm -mm. Like you said, even the reviews. Yeah. You, know? you know, I was thinking about um, science fiction, actually, the other day, and uh, I was walking around the, the square in Prescott, and that is the backdrop of Back to the Future, and sometimes Prescott gets mistaken of like, oh, they filmed Back to the Future because of the courthouse, but it's not. Right. And so when they wrote that, and that was in the 80s, hoverboards were supposed to be here. They were one right. year off with the Cubs winning the World Series. Um, but where do you see like that direction of science fiction? Because it seems like a lot of the things that people were writing in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, they've slowly been in introduced into our society. We've, we've got that technology now. So where do you see science fiction for the 21st century heading? Okay. People have to remember that science fiction is accidentally predictive. Oh, okay. It very rarely that somebody, particularly somebody who writes science fiction on a regular basis, sits down to make a prediction. Now, H.G. Wells did and Jules Verne did. Yeah. But generally in modern science fiction, it's the story that comes first. Okay. And it may be about a futuristic subject, particularly, particularly what you'd call near science fiction. But the idea is not necessarily to predict something specific. The idea is to tell a good story about what you think something in the future might be like. I'll give you an example. I was born in 1946. A story came out in Astounding Science Fiction, which was the precursor to Analog. They just The magazine just underwent a name change. Uh, by a writer, a wonderful writer, one of my favorites, whose name was Murray Leinster, real name Will F. Jenkins, called A Logic Named Joe. Little short story. And in the story, uh, Leinster predicts the home computer and the internet. Okay. This is 1946. You can't even imagine something no. like the home computer and the internet. But if you read the story, it's uncannily predictive. Uncan there are uh, things called tanks where information is stored. Those are ISPs. People have what's called a logic at home, which is basically a home computer, mm -hmm. on which you can access any information anywhere in the world from sports scores to stock numbers. It's an astounding little story. I'm sure most people can probably read it online for free. I'm sure it's uh, up there with Gutenberg or somebody else. But Leinster was using some ideas to tell a story. And the story was basically what happens if one of these logics, one of these tanks, excuse me, uh, decides to answer uh, one guy's question, every, a group of people's questions, exactly as they're asked. For example, what's the best way to murder your neighbor without getting caught? Machine provides the answer. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you've got a little crisis brewing here. Right. Because you're dealing with human beings on the other end. And the story is told from the, the point of view of a logic repairman who sees what's happening and fixes it. And this is an issue that we can deal with even today. Right. So a fascinating old story. Now you consider how long ago that was written. Back in a time when the, uh, the CEO of IBM, a nascent uh, IBM, was asked by reporters, you know, what, they, what he thought the worldwide market for computers were, and he said six, <laughs> and you see how much things have changed. So when you're building a future, particularly a mm -hmm. near future, you really try to be accurate and thoughtful about what might happen but it's like it's like hunting mice with a shotgun. Okay. You know, one pellet might hit, the other hundred ninety nine pellets miss. Okay. And then everybody thinks you're a great shot. Mm -hmm. Or in the case of science fiction, well, he predicted that because he intended to. Okay. So you're not really like writing, sitting down and writing. You're just going with like a like a conscious flow of ideas. That's right. Right. And if you're building your near future, say, say you have interstellar travel. Right. You have to do something that at least makes some kind of sense from the standpoint of physics and astrophysics. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have to be 100% accurate. Uh, current science says it's impossible, but if you take it away, you probably lose your story. But right. You have to do a, you have to do your research. You have to maintain what's called the internal logic. Okay, and what is that? Is that 
Well, one spaceship goes at a certain speed and reaches a world that is, you know, and the next spaceship, somebody snaps their fingers and gets there. You've killed the internal logic. It's either all one way or all the other. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's true of most fiction, actually, but it's particularly true of science fiction. Okay. So uh, going back, you're talking about how robots are um, a part of science fiction. Right. 2020 is the year where robots are really coming in into style now. Like uh, we took some students up to Flagstaff, and there's uh, robots delivering food. Right. right. So do you see, like, robots coming into our society um, anytime soon? Like, say, like, um, C-3PO or any other um, droid, if you will? Oh, absolutely. Then, okay. But it's happening so fast and yet so subtly that people aren't aware it's happening. Oh. Like the food delivery robots at various colleges. Mm-hmm. Uh, one minute, it's shocking to see. Right. And then in a couple of months, it's just normal. Ah, yeah. So they're normalizing... That's right. That observation. That's right. Now, humaniform robots, which are robots like C-3PO that look like us, that's going to take a lot longer because that's nothing but a cosmetic decision. Right. It has nothing to do with practicality. If you need a robot to lift something, you have what, uh, you have like an industrial robot, which is basically a really powerful arm attached to a motor controlled by programming. Mm-hmm. It doesn't look anything like C-3PO. No. But those robots are in every factory in the United States practically now, in the world now practically. And the next step will be mobile robots outside the factory, like the one you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Uh, And pretty soon we're going to have, well, at what point does an autonomous driving vehicle be counted as a robot (laughs) or a car? I'm getting into my car to go someplace. I'm getting into my robot to go someplace. Uh, the Japanese are in the forefront of developing robots to help with everyday life. They, they have one developed to comfort people in you know, a home for elderly. Wow. You can't hire somebody, but it sits there and it answers and it listens and it has some sort of a face. And I suppose if you're a 96-year-old person confined to that room, it's nice to have somebody to talk to, mm-hmm. especially if they're responsive and have a nice voice. And the program to listen. Exactly, exactly. And those are the sorts of robots we're going to see more and more. Okay. Uh, you already can buy a robot that'll vacuum your house. Right. It doesn't look anything like C-3PO, more like R2-D2. But a little not bit, quite. yeah. But it exists. And nobody thinks twice about going to the store and buying that robot. And no. they don't think, it's not a robot. It doesn't look like C-3PO, but mm-hmm. it's a robot. There are trucks driving around this country right now mm-hmm. delivering goods that do not have drivers. It's all programming. So do you consider that truck a robot? You start getting into, I think what, what most people really think of as a robot is one that is capable of thought. Okay. And that's something that all of the people working in any AI are working for right now. Mm-hmm. And we are still a fair ways away from that. It's one thing to have something that's programmable, whether mm-hmm. it, it's a machine arm in a factory or a truck or a car or something that vacuums your house and something else that vacuums your house that looks back at you and says, I don't think we should vacuum this corner right. because it looks like there's a mouse living there. And you say vacuum that corner and then it says, well, I'm just making a recommendation. If you see where I'm going, something that has something like human intelligence. We're a ways away from that. Mm-hmm. We're a ways away from that. On the other hand, we do have politicians who are actually robots, so. I could see that. I, I, could, I can <clears throat> list a couple number of robots. They're really good facsimiles. Mm-hmm. I won't name names. <laughs> no, that's a good joke. AI that can think for itself, is that too, like, um, is that not realistic, or do you think we're going to get there? Is that, like, us, our next step in human evolution is to create a robot or become like that sentient being? No, it's the, it's the next stop in robot evolution okay. or AI evolution. I absolutely think we'll get there. I did a book years ago called The Eye Inside. Okay. It's basically about two people, but there is a giant machine called the Caligatark, which is buried in a mountain in Switzerland that has artificial intelligence. And it makes recommendations. Hmm. People are worried about Skynet and stuff like that from the trans... But what this machine does is it makes recommendations to human beings that it thinks will help humanity. It has no self-interest in, in you know, taking over the world. That's, that's just not what it does. 
it doesn't give any orders at all. Mm -hmm. But if it says, plant your crop on March 16th instead of March 23rd, and the people who plant their crop on that day get a better crop, people are going to listen to the machine. Right. And I think that's the kind of artificial intelligence that we're not only looking for, but going to get. Okay. Do you think there would be like a bias when it comes to that AI? Because I, I would imagine, I just met you, but I feel like our core values and morals are probably different. Maybe they're similar. But it, who's to say that somebody can go in AI, program it morally, and it may not be what you're, you think the correct moral is, but then it starts kind of like brainwashing because if you're just saying recommendations, hey, should I cheat on my wife tonight? That's like, going to be the key. Okay. Is who watches the programmers. Right. And I don't have an easy answer for that. No. But we're going to have to figure that one out because we're going to have these machines. We're going mm -hmm. to have these devices and people will program them mm -hmm. and somebody has to watch the programmers. Right. Otherwise, you get a situation like... Um, one of my very favorite writers in science fiction is Robert Sheckley, who died a number of years ago. I think he's the greatest short story writer the field ever produced. Okay. And he wrote a story that appeared in Galaxy Magazine back in the 50s called Watchbird. And the idea was that government has come up with these flying devices, no drones back in the 50s, that are armed and individually programmed to catch lawbreakers. And they can't be interfered with. They can't be reprogrammed. They are independent entities. And for a while, it works really well. And what happens is the watchbirds start getting really, really particular about how they judge their programming. For example, is a farmer cutting wheat, killing a living being? Is that murder? Well, there's obvious real problems there, but he starves. The government doesn't know what to do because these things are armored. They're all over the place. So they come up with a more powerful device mm. that hunts down and takes out all the watchbirds. But then what do you do with those devices? Right. And it kind of goes on like that. And that's how you end up with something like Skynet. So you have to be really careful about programming and about who's watching the programmers. Right. And that's in the 50s. They're basically armed drones. Mm. Again, another case of a science fiction story really predicting something when the idea isn't to predict it. My dad watched a lot of science fiction, so I, I grew up with science fiction. I don't know if it has warped my like point of view, but when it comes to like robots and like you're saying, like, but is the self-driving car a robot? I would say yes, and especially if you program it. I just think of like the next terrorist attack. Like if we have all these robots, who say somebody can hack into the system and just like kill all your masters, or we're gonna have a car crash on um, on the highway at this time and you can't do anything because you're just like driving. So that's where my mind goes when it comes to program fortunately for us terrorists have very little imagination yeah there are much worse things you can do uh if you're a terrorist than go out and and blow up a plane or shoot people right and i'm not going to go into it no these are not secrets but mm -hmm. i don't see any reason to publicize them right but the japanese had one idea for example during world war ii mm -hmm. which was to drop incendiary devices in american forests Okay. A very simple thing to do, cause much more chaos than lobbing a few shells into Los Angeles Harbor. But again, terrorists have very little imagination. Those are the things that scare me. Yeah. Uh, those are the things that you can't really guard against. Uh, look at the fires in Australia recently. I know, right? Suppose those had been set by a terrorist. They weren't. But you see what kind of damage and chaos you can cause. Science fiction, by the way, is a very good way of looking at problems like that and trying to figure out ways to stop it. And those of us in the field, uh, we try, if we have an idea that deals with something like that, we try to pass it along to various organizations, at least some of us do. Oh, okay, so yeah. it's like your activism in a way. Like, Well, we there's have... actually a group. Oh, there is? Okay. Yes, and we don't need to talk about that, although it's not any particular big secret either. But there's, well... There's a group of us who belong to a group, uh, an organization called Sigma. And Sigma passes ideas along to DARPA. Okay. And our job is to, th as science fiction writers, is to think outside, outside the box. Outside, outside of the box. In okay. other words, the craziest, most far out things you can think of um, dealing with subjects like terrorism and floods and climate change. Right. And transportation. If we come up with something totally wacko, uh, we pass it along because every once in a while, it's one of those wacko ideas 
like Arthur Clarke writing in the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society in 1946, saying, look, if you had three satellites spaced around the planet at this distance, you could relay radio signals all <laughs> over the world. Okay. Arthur said that he should have copyrighted that idea, but he didn't, or he'd be richer than Bill Gates. Totally crazy idea. There were no artificial satellites in, again, 1946. That was a good year. Yeah, it was, yeah. Um, there were no artificial satellites in 1946, and it was just a science fictional notion. But mm -hmm. Arthur came up with an idea using that notion in a practical way. And lo and behold, nowadays, relating back to what we were talking about earlier, nobody questions that. The mm -hmm. idea of communication satellite. No. It's just a normal part of life. But somebody had to come up with the idea first. Arthur didn't work it into a story. Arthur Clarke was the one who wrote 2001. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why a lot of the communication satellites are in an orbit, I should go this way, an <laughs> orbit called the Clark Belt, in case people have been wondering about that. Again, we're here with Alan Dean Foster, Prescott Local, um, author of, how many books have you written? Uh, 136. 136. Um, and you've done novelizations of books like The Thing, Dark Star, um, Star Wars. You, yeah. You've got contract to do some Star Trek um, novel, novels. Too. There was a um, um, an animated Star Trek okay. that ran for a couple of years. It was done by a studio in Los Angeles called Filmation. It was, it was what is called limited animation. Mm -hmm. Not as bad as Clutch Cargo, for anybody who remembers that. Clutch Cargo was an animated TV show where the only thing that moved were the mouths. Okay. Nothing else moved in this show. Uh, you better have good stories for something like that. Mm -hmm. So the animated Star Trek uh, ran for two seasons, and I did adaptations in book form of all of the stories for the two seasons. Called The books were called the Star Trek Logs. I also wrote the story for the first Star Trek movie, but okay. that has nothing to do with, with book writing. Mm -mm. And yeah, so that was my involvement with Star Trek. I also did the the novelizations, the book versions of the first two rebooted Star Trek movies. Okay. Star Trek, uh, directed by J.J. Abrams and Star Trek in the Darkness. Okay. So I have had quite an involvement with Star Trek. Yes. Right. So I've been trying to wrap my mind around um, how does one like write the novelization of a film, like do you take the screenplay and you make it into a novel, or how how how's that process work? For me, I can't mm -hmm. speak for other writers, but I think it's probably pretty similar. You get a copy of the screenplay, and you set the screenplay up here on a stand. And screenplays generally, as a very rough estimate, you get about one pay, one minute of film for every minute of screenplay. Mm -hmm. So if you have a 120 page screenplay, you probably working on a two hour film. There are exceptions, of course, but that's, that's a general rule of thumb. A normal novel running around 80,000 words, you need about 360 to 370 pages of double space type prose. So my practice was to set up the screenplay and I knew that I had to get three pages of prose out of every page of screenplay. Okay. Sometimes I'd get ahead, have a little cushion. Sometimes I'd fall behind. I'd have to invent something else. Also, if you're lucky, you will get things like pre-production drawings, uh, stills from the set, uh, maybe a film clip, but uh, you don't get a lot. And the idea is you have to take the screenplay and do your own director's cut of the movie, your extended director's that's cut. That's pretty cool. And yes, that's the that's fun really part. That's really cool, yeah. That's the fun part. So, for example, if you're if you're writing the book version of something like uh, Clash of the Titans, you can talk a lot more about Zeus than they show in the film. Right. Get inside his head, see what his motivations are, and you expand the original screenplay in that way. Um, when I did Alien, the that was a tough one because 20th Century Fox wouldn't show any pictures of the alien anybody. And I was like, well, I've got this screenplay, but I don't have any pictures of the thing I'm supposed to be writing about. And well, that's tough. That's, wow, so if you okay. read the book version of Alien, there's no description of the alien in it. Interesting, um, okay. That, that was an exception, and fortunately it was an exception because that's tough. That is tough. The other thing, you try to do things like when you're describing, you want to make sure that the book, although it's an expansion of the screenplay, matches the film as closely as possible. That's why it's important to have things like stills so that if you're describing a character, it looks it's, it reads like the character in the book, 
um, the character in the book, excuse me, reads like you, you see the character in the film. You don't want this great physical discrepancy. It throws people off. Right. So um, I was um, flipping through the original Star Wars book, um, and one thing that really stuck me out from your writing from the actual movie is, like, at the beginning of the film, and the droids are going to see Princess Leia, in your book you're describing that uh, body parts are flying, and, like, more details went on. I was like, oh, it's very interesting, because it's like, if you see that scene on Star Wars, it's very innocent. And then in their book form, it's like, oh, no, people's limbs are getting blown off. There's blood going on. I had not seen the film. Okay. You very rarely get to see the film when you're writing the book adaptation. Mm-hmm. So all I have is this brief description, sometimes one line or two lines in the screenplay of what's right. going on. It's like, um, and I don't remember the screenplay word for word, but based on what you just said, it's kind of like stormtroopers enter the traitor and start shooting. Yeah. Well, you're not going to get a book out of that. That has to be expanded somehow, so you mm-hmm. describe the results of the shooting. Nice. Uh, generally, and if the studio leaves you alone, then you as a writer can have an enjoyable time. Okay. And usually they do, because a, a, a novelization is an ancillary right, just like selling the rights to put images of the characters on lunch pails or McDonald's cups or something. Right. So very rarely does the studio get involved. They get involved more now, although there are a lot fewer movie adaptations being done uh, in book form because we now have extended cuts on DVD and and so on. But that's the fun part. If the studio leaves you alone, you can do certain things. And now everything is a franchise and mm-hmm. it's controlled. Uh, I'll give you an example. I did the, the book version of The Force Awakens. Okay, yeah. The seventh Star Wars. Film. Right. I got the screenplay and stills and I already knew what the major characters look like. And I added as much as I could to make a book out of it. Some of the things they left in and a lot of them they took out because now everybody is afraid and this is not just a characteristic of Star Wars, it's a characteristic of any of these ongoing film or TV franchises. It's not that what you write might contradict something that's in the film. It's that something you write might contradict something that somebody might want to do six six years down the road. Right. So they're being proactively paranoid, I guess. There is a super weapon in the film, and it doesn't it doesn't really align with the known laws of physics. For example, you can't pull down a piece of a star like you're draining a milk bottle. For one thing, even if you could, it would immediately fry all life on the planet and the atmosphere would immediately burn off and you basically couldn't control it. It's not like pulling taffy. So I thought, purely for the reader, purely for the fans, I would try to come up with a device that actually could blow up planets. Nice, okay. And it entailed as much research as I've done in a long time for a novelization. And I started reading astrophysics and I came up with what I thought was a potentially theoretically workable device. Uh, It takes up about two pages of description, which is a lot more than I usually do in a book, in the book. Right. And I did read some reviews where people just, who mentioned it at all, said, well, this is just more, this is more foo-for-ah. You know, this has no basis in fact. And I'm kind of smiling to myself because, yeah, it really does have a basis in actual physics. And I thought I was pretty safe because there are probably six people on the planet who actually understand all the details of what I was writing about. I wasn't one of them, but I thought I faked it pretty good. And, uh, you know, to the point to where if Neil deGrasse Tyson read it, you know, he wouldn't break out in hysterics. Okay. Uh, But I didn't have to do that. I could have gone with what was in the film and just described it and left it at that. But as someone who cares about the science in his science fiction right. and the details in his writing, I felt compelled to do that. And I was sure they'd take it out mm-hmm. because it did not conform directly to what was on screen. And they left it in. Really? Awesome. Yeah. So simple things that I thought they would leave in, they took out mm-hmm. largely, well, at least partially for the reason I just gave you, that might conflict with something that nobody's done yet. And some of the things I thought uh, they would take out, they left in. I just have to say it's a, a great honor to have you sitting down with us because you are one of the few people who were involved 
with Star Wars um, from the beginning. Like we just in 2019 just uh, ended the Skywalker saga, and you were there from the beginning. So like, um, how did you get approached to write the novelization for Star Wars? I'm not exactly sure, right. <clears throat> but the story that I was kind of given was uh, I had I'd written a book called Ice Rigger. That was my third original novel, and it sold particularly well. Okay. And someone apparently thought that the spirit of Ice Rigger was similar to the spirit of this film that they were making. And I had already done some novelizations. So it was suggested that I might be the person to do the book adaptation of this film that was coming out. I was asked if I was interested, and I knew Lucas's work from THX 1138, and American Graffiti, of course. Mm -hmm. So I was sent over to see Lucas's lawyer, a gentleman named Pollock, in his office on Hollywood Boulevard overlooking, it was Hollywood Boulevard or Sunset Boulevard, uh, probably to determine that, you know, A, I was coherent and not an ax, secret axe murderer or something. Right. And I passed that test, I guess. And then they said, well, we need to send you out and get, get approval from George. So I was sent out to Industrial Light and Magic, which at that time was a rented warehouse in Van Nuys. Kind of wandered around there until George came out and we talked a little bit and he showed me the Death Star, which is about this big, and some other really neat things. And uh, I wandered around some more. He went back to work. And there was this fellow who said, uh, come here, you want to see something interesting? And I just want to kind of, well, kind of wanted to just get on with it. I had the book to write. And it turned out to be John Dykstra who was trying to show me the first computer-controlled motion picture camera in Hollywood. Ooh, all right. But, you know, I didn't know, so probably should have stood there and listened to him for three hours. And I went home with a two-book contract to write the book version of the film and also a sequel novel. Okay. The sequel novel being what became Splinter of the Mind's Eye. The idea being that there would be, if the film was a success, there would be subsidiary material for prospective fans of the film. And I had only one restriction put on me uh, by George. He said, I want you to, you have to write it so it can be filmed on a low budget. Okay. His idea being that if the film was not a huge success, but was not a big flop, he could make a cheap sequel utilizing existing props and existing costumes. Smart. So I set the film on a frog-shrouded planet, which eliminates the need for expensive backdrops and no CGI in those days. All right. And a lot of it is underground for the same reason. And the only thing that he asked me to cut out of the finished manuscript was I had opened the book with a fairly elaborate battle in space that forces Luke and Leia down on this fog-shrouded planet, and that would have been expensive to film. So it had nothing to do with the way it was written or the content. It was just, it would have been expensive to film, so I had to cut that out. Okay. Otherwise, the book stayed pretty much as I wrote it. And is that uh, now canon? Because it is published, right? It's, it's part of what's called legacy Star Wars, I think. Okay. So it's not canon. Although, interestingly enough, the planet, the fog-shrouded planet Mimban, mm -hmm. shows up in Rogue One, I guess it is. And it's, they pick and choose from, you know, there's an enormous amount of material out there. Right. And every once in a while, somebody will say, hey, why don't we stick this in a film? I guess that's how it works. Okay. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of fans think they would have been better off simply going with some of the more impressive subsidiary books that came out and using those as the basis for sequel films like Timothy Zahn's Thrawn trilogy for example which is a particular favorite of fans mm -hmm. but everything was just kind of shoved aside and this is now legacy Star Wars it's not canon it's not real and from a corporate standpoint they understand that they want complete control over mm -hmm. the direction everything takes right how did you feel when they're like we're just going to scrap your um uh, manuscript for the sequel. Well, I was disappointed. Okay. I mean, Star Wars became an enormous success on its way to becoming a phenomenon. Right. And I thought the book would have made a nice film, Splinter the Mind's Eye, and so did other people. But at that point, George was able to do anything he wanted, and he went in a different direction. Right. And I understand that. If you want to work in film or television at all, and you don't understand that, you will go crazy in a very short period of time. Like your ideas are just going to take uh, uh, one, 180 somewhere else? or There's or... a book, and I, I can never remember the name of it, okay. but it's, it was written by a husband and wife writing team who've made a career out of screenwriting. 
And they had written a movie and it was all set to be produced and some changes were asked for. And this went through various revisions and then the regime changes at the studio. And, and it's like lions killing the cubs, male lions killing the cubs sired by another male lion when they take over a pride. The new people don't really want to deal with something that somebody else bought or greenlighted. So mm-hmm. those projects go aside. Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, this film was eventually produced after about 10 or 12 revisions and studio changes and personnel changes. And guess which version of it was finally produced? The original. The original, the original yes. yes. And that's the sort of thing that will drive you crazy if you're a creative person in the motion picture business. Okay. But you have to be prepared for that. And I have told people, younger writers, who say I have some interest from this studio or this production company or this actor in making this as a film, and they're asking for advice, and I say, just, you have two choices. You can try to get involved as an executive producer, not as the writer, because the writer has no control over anything, Damn. unless your name is Stephen King. Uh, you can try to get involved in some mess with Or you sell it, you take the money, and you forget about it. It is no longer your child. You have put it out. It has been adopted by another couple, and it is no longer your child. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, your sanity goes away. And time after time, I'll make suggestions uh, when I'm doing the novelization, and I'll write the production company, and I'll say, I think this might work really well here. And you know nothing's going to happen, and you have to go at it with that attitude. Because if you don't, mm-hmm. you go crazy. I could see that, yeah. Go crazy. Uh, having somebody in like a suit telling you how to shape your creativity over time, um, I think I would go crazy with that. That's what happens. That's mm-hmm. what happens. Because in Hollywood, and I'm sure in any film industry, people know they can't sew the costumes, they can't make the sets, they can't do the CGI, they can't act, they can't direct, they can't run the camera, but everybody thinks they can write. Hmm. And if you can get your name, a piece of the credit, uh, get your name up on screen, then the Writers Guild goes to bat for you, and you get X number of dollars for the rest of your life. Not bad. A percentage of the film or a credit. Mm -hmm. Uh, However the contract is worded. And the the guilds are very protective of their people. Oh, totally. I can see that. Yeah. Yeah, um, So I guess just... Another Star Wars question. I want to, uh, you know, saturate it with that. Yeah. Um, what's your initial thought of the book? Because now it's like a nine. It's a global phenomenon, like you said. Um, the Skywalker um, saga just finished. You have the Mandalorian now. You have Rogue One. Like, what was your initial thoughts of like and Clone Wars is and Clone bad. Wars? Yeah. You mean when I was first working on it? Yeah, when you first look at it, you're like the adventurous Luke Skywalker. Um, I read the screenplay, mm-hmm. and as I'm reading it and getting from one scene to another, I'm thinking. This is pretty good stuff. They'll never get it on screen. Really? Okay. Never get it on screen. If they can get it on screen, this will be great. Now, this is me as an old-time science fiction fan and reader thinking, or at that point, a young one anyway. Um, And I thought, well, it'd be great if they can get it on screen, but it's not going to happen the way it's written in the screenplay. And my wife and I went to a cast and crew screening of the finished film. A cast and crew screening is the first time that a lot of people who've worked on the film see their work all put together and see the finished film. And we came out of the theater and I thought, well, that that was great. That was fantastic. That's what people who love space opera have been dreaming about for decades. And this film's going to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And I went afterwards to the very first public screening which was at Grumman's Chinese Theater. Ah, I, think yeah. it, I think it was 10 o'clock in the morning. Okay. I sat in the back of the auditorium so I could watch the... I'd seen the film, so I could watch the audience. The only watch, audience went berserk. And then it tried to figure out how I could buy some stock. <laughs> and I didn't have any money. So we talked about your novelization of films. Um, where do you get the concepts for your own um, series? Because you have a few novel series, right? You have Pip and Flinks, yeah, right? The Commonwealth series. The Commonwealth. Pip and Flinks is part of that. Right. And the Spellsinger series. Mm-hmm. And a lot of standalone novels, too. Uh, sometimes an environment will come first. I'm very environmentally oriented in a lot of my books. Okay. Uh, Midworld, Ice Rig, I've already mentioned. Drowning World. These all feature different alien environments, and I'll get the idea 
for the planet, for the environment first, and then I'll populate it with characters. Sometimes a character will come first. And I think, well, this would be interesting. Uh, I did a book called The Man Who Used the Universe, which is about a guy who has the worst upbringing you can imagine. His mother is a prostitute. She sells him. Oh, wow. okay. uh, he becomes a minor, minor character in the underworld of his planet, and then a crime chief, and then he eventually becomes a leader. And he does all of the things he does in his life have beneficial results. And people think he's a great guy. But all he's doing throughout the entire novel is trying to ensure his own health and well-being. Hmm. And that came about from me thinking, what if Jesus came back? <laughs> and the only thing Jesus was interested in was taking care of Jesus. But everything he did to do that had these benign spin-offs. Right. So, yeah. for example, this character, whose name is Keys Van Lou Macklin, cleans up all the pollution on his home world, not because he's interested in helping the environment, but because it's easier for him to breathe <laughs> if you get rid of all the pollutants. But everybody thinks, wow, what a great guy. Mm -hmm. And in the end, he actually, uh, uh, he, settle, he prevents an interstellar war between humankind and a, an alien species called the Null, not because he's interested in preventing war, but because war would be bad for him. Right. So the idea of that character who does all of these really good things for entirely selfish reasons came to me, and that's how that book came about. Nice. And then sometimes I'll just have an idea that, you know, pops out of nowhere. I'll sit and think. I have a recent novel called Relic, okay. which is about the last, what if you were the last human being in the galaxy? <sighs> that's lonely. Everybody else has been wiped out by an intergalactic plague that we started as part of biological warfare. And this guy has taken, he's, for some reason, he's immune. And he's found wandering around on one of these devastated worlds by a race of benign, intelligent aliens. And he becomes kind of a walking museum exhibit. Okay. But he's really lonely. The aliens want to clone him, his DNA and everything, to try to help resurrect the human race because they're interested in that sort of thing. And the guy is not sure that that's a good idea. We've really screwed everything up, you know, we've had our run, why bring us back? And the book goes on from that idea. What if you were the last human being? Nice. How would you handle it? Yeah, how would you handle it? Yeah, okay. So, so the ideas come from a lot of different places for original stories. One about robots, <clears throat> a short story. And the way the robots actually take over is there are robots in industrial plants, there are robots in schools, there are robots doing pretty much everything. Uh, and they're not doing anything bad, but the robots who are taking care of the agriculture, our agriculture, our food supply, they just gradually introduce some little genetically modified things in there. Not to kill us, but right. to make us a little more relaxed and happy okay. and amenable okay. so that the robots can get on with the business of taking care of important things. Ideas come from all over the place. Okay. What about creating your aliens? I mean, you have to have a really um, awesome imagination to think about other sentient beings. Where, where does that inspiration come from? Um, I love creating alien environments, and okay. I love creating the aliens, both unintelligent and intelligent, mm -hmm. that populate them. And the key to that, again, is maintaining the internal logic. There is no point, for example, on having a uh, an eight-foot-tall green alien that weighs 600 pounds on a low gravity planet right yeah because he would you know it, it just wouldn't work out and vice versa so if you're going to create an alien plant or an alien creature or an alien intelligent being the whole ecology has to fit together everything has to fit close to you can't just have you can't just throw stuff around because then it becomes fantasy right then you have unicorns and manticores and and dragons. Uh, but in science fiction, that doesn't work. I actually did write a novel called Quofum in which this party of explorers lands on a world where you find exactly that. There's this one biome over here, and then there's another totally unrelated one over here. And it looks like evolution has simply lost control of the narrative. And you find out that it was a group of long dead aliens mm -hmm. who were experimenting. Okay. Everything works, the internal logic works, and even the internal logic of something that doesn't seem to make any sense has to work. Right, you're talking about biome, so you pretty much have to 
study the different biomes, then create that alien that would live in that environment? Yes, correct? there was a, a very famous uh, science fiction novel called Mission, uh, Mission of Gravity. Okay. Written by a wonderful writer named Harry Clement. Uh, excuse me, how Clement, real name was Harry Clement Stubbs. And it's about a world that's actually oval shaped. It's been, the planet is oval shaped. It has been distorted by gravity. Okay. So the gravity at the poles is much stronger than the gravity at the equator because the way the planet works, what kind of creature could handle that kind of difference in gravity? Particularly when you have a gravity that's many, many times that of Earth. Well, it will be low to the ground and spread out and strong and maybe many legs so it could get around. Okay. Uh, probably the earliest book of its type and wonderfully well written. Uh, so, you again, you have to maintain the internal logic. I forget mm -hmm. what your question was. <laughs> uh, you have to do like um, research in the biome to fit that um, character or that alien, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example from a book of mine called Midworld, which is about a planet where all of the land masses are covered by one solid rainforest where the trees reach up to a thousand meters high. And well, it, it, how do you make that tree function? How do you make the water get from the bottom to the top over that distance? How do you fix nitrogen in the soil? Right. Well, I had a tree called the Volt tree, Volt tree. And the idea is that it, it has metallic fibers in it. Okay. And it conducts lightning down into the soil because lightning will fix nitrogen. Now nice. this is not integral in any way to the story but it's, it's important for the background. Okay. And you have to, if you get all the background right on that, then suddenly your environment in the story becomes believable. Right. If you just say that, hey, there's a, a forest a thousand meters high, it doesn't mean anything to the reader. It shouldn't if he's a good science, if you write a lot of science fiction. Right, like you have. Yeah, so what kind of creatures? Well, there, there's like seven different levels in there. There's like seven different vertical environments. Right. And the creatures that live on the top are way different from the creatures who live in the darkness because no light reaches the ground. Right. Reaches the bottom. You have a lot of fun playing with the different levels and the different creatures. Right. Because it seems like you're creating a hierarchy. You're creating a food chain. Um, and then uh, also um, that social order in a way, too, of all those creatures. Right? All of that has to work. Right. Uh, the humans on the planet are the... Uh, generational survivors of a crash colony ship that went off course ended up here and the people who survived adapted to the environment not the other way around right and they have found a place in the center of a really big tree that they call the home tree that part of the tree in that part of the tree consists of really dangerous thorny vines that essentially form a natural stockade around the part of the tree where people live mm-hmm well, the people who live in there, there are hollows in the area where they live where they defecate and urinate. Okay. That helps fertilize the tree. Right, yeah. And in return, the tree recognizes that contribution. We needn't go into the biology and the chemistry. No. So if somebody is outside the tree and comes to it and is from that tree, they can spit into one of the flowers that are on the vines. The tree recognizes the spit, actually chemically analyzes the spit, recognizes it, as a symbiote with the tree really? and the vines kind of part so that people can get back into the center of the tree. Again, none of this stuff is integral to the actual story, right. but you're creating a believable environment. Right. That's so fascinating. You can't, if you're writing contemporary fiction, you can't describe New York, Manhattan, no. and Albuquerque in the same way mm -mm. because they're entirely different environments. Right. And it's very much the same, if it's very much more so in science fiction. Right. That's so fascinating that you had that idea of having someone urinate to um, fertilize the tree and then you spit in it and it's that uh, that relationship, that natural relationship. Symbiotic that happens. relationship, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Uh, this next question might uh, show everybody how much of a dork I am, but we're talking about characters and whatnot. So this one's a visual. Um, I would like to get your thoughts on what you think about this uh, character um, <laughs> coming up. Always suspicious of things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jar what do you think about Poor Jar Jar. Jar Jar Binks? Yeah, Poor I loved him. Jar Jar. Loved him as a kid, and now he's just a meme. So. Um, first of all, I don't think there's a racist bone in George Lucas. I don't think so body. either. That's not racist. What no. Jar? What George was trying to do, and George is very good with names. Right. There may be some things he doesn't write quite as well, but he's really good with alien names. They're consistent. Yeah. 
And what he was trying to do with Jar Jar was have comic relief in the film. Exactly. And the fact that he had a sort of a Jamaican accent. Yeah, man. Yeah, that's not a that's not a racist accent. No. But unfortunately, it didn't come across that way in the film. No. And I think because, since you asked my opinion, please, uh, it's because Jar Jar is obviously comic relief, mm -hmm. and it's jarring, if I may say so, <laughs> to just thrust that kind of comic relief into a film. Right. I think it would have been much more natural. Han Solo tells gets off a lot of witty lines. Oh, he's funny. People laugh, but he's not comic relief. I think if Mr. Binks <laughs> had simply been another alien character that they got involved with, who got off some funny one-liners, that would have been better. Mm -hmm. As far as the problematical accent goes, well, nobody, I'm sure, in the production process thought that was a bad idea. It probably looked fine. Really? But yeah. things that look fine in a screenplay... And sometimes even on a set, when you're suddenly sitting in the theater and seeing them on a big screen, they might come off differently. And Jar Jar came off differently. Right. And I think like when you're a little kid, you don't really see the difference uh, between that because the prequels came out when I was in uh, um, eighth grade, sixth grade, actually. And I didn't mind that. And then now I'm, I'm older and I saw the last three um, sequels. And I'm like, this is for kids. Like, I, I felt nothing because it, it didn't capture the same thing that I was as a kid. So I see a Jar Jar as kind of like the, the, um, the lost cousin, or like, oh, we don't talk about Uncle Jar Jar because you know, it's, but it's for kids. It's for kids. My favorite novel of all time is The Lost World by Conan Doyle. Okay. And the introduction to that, which I know George has used too, is I've done my. This is by Conan Doyle. I've done my simple plan, if I give one hour of joy, to the boy who's half a man or the man who's half a boy. Wow. And that's basically what Star Wars is. Uh, if you're going to read, it's only as it got more developed and we got into the prequels that things became more serious than they should have. Right. Um, I mean, there were certain things that everybody has their own Star Wars. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my Star Wars, Darth Vader who has killed millions of people, or at least participated in the deaths of millions of people, doesn't get off by saying on his deathbed, you know, well, I'm sorry, and throwing the emperor <laughs> over the rail. That's like saying Hitler is on his deathbed and saying, well, I'm sorry about the concentration camps but, yeah. and the six million Jews I killed, mm -hmm. but and then suddenly he's a good guy. I just couldn't buy that. I know why it was done, but for me personally, it didn't work. And my thought was that Vader is actually Luke's evil older brother oh, okay. who killed their father mm. and is hiding it from Luke and he dies in that in the third film Vader does along with the Emperor if you want right I thought that would have made Vader a much more interesting character interesting. but then you don't have the prequels at all really nothing <clears throat> so mm -mm. everybody has their own Star Wars right some people are perfectly happy with episode 8 mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people are not and the same thing goes for the prequels, and the same thing goes for the first three films as far as that exactly. goes. Well, I mean, I think you make a good point. I mean, nowadays, everyone can write fan fiction, right? Oh, thank you. Oh, you want to put Jar Jar away? Huh? Well, Jar Jar probably needs to hide at this point. He's probably had too much exposure. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so, fandom. All right? I think that's where all the critics come from with uh, films and books. Do you have um, fans? Like, do you have a fandom? Do they do um, fan fiction for you? Well, I have a, uh, one of my publishers, Open Road Media, maintains a fan page. Okay. And I occasionally say something there, and if somebody writes a question there, or on my regular web page, which has my email address on it, mm -hmm. I've answered every fan letter and every email nice. I've ever gotten from okay. the beginning myself. I don't have a secretary do it. I don't have an assistant do it. I feel that's little enough to do. People aren't asking for money mm -hmm. most of the time. Uh, and, and, you know, I can do that. And it's fun. I appreciate the feedback. I, I appreciate the uh, the appreciation. Mm -hmm. I think any performer does. Every actor I've ever met, and we've discussed the subject, or musician, if you don't, if you have a dead audience, whether it's in the theater, or in the in the motion picture theater, or in an mm -hmm. audience at a music festival, if they don't get any feedback. You know, it's like, why am I doing this? Exactly. And you can tell from the, it's, it's a mutual, it's another symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. And it certainly is between the writer 
and the reader. Well, Alan, uh, thank you very much for spending time here at the Five Senses Magazine podcast. Um, My pleasure. I think I learned a lot more about um, what goes into science fiction writing. Um, and I really appreciate what you shared with us about going out and experience the world, doing your research, and then, like you are saying, the internal logic yeah. that has to make sense. And I would, um, you know, I'm looking forward to your next article um, in Five Senses, and I would love to sit down with you, have another iced tea and coffee, and talk more. If you like what you heard and want more content from Five Senses Magazine, please check us out at fiveensesmag.com.